New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Brad. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Happy New Year. Give your copy of God's Word. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 1 today as we begin our sermon series entitled First Love. And really, I think it's a season in our church, is what I'm praying that this is a season where we talk about our first love. And, uh, and we'll get to Revelation here in just a minute. So I'm going to give some married guys. I'm going to give you some advice. Single, unmarried, yet to be married, guys, write this down. I promise you, write this down. You will thank me later. <clears throat> and if you knew all the times I mess up, me and a husband's like, what business do I have to give marriage advice? Never stop pursuing your spouse. Nathan, did you guys write this down? Are we, okay, all right. Never stop pursuing your spouse, your wife, ever. Ever. We ought to always be in a situation whereby we are remembering what brought us to her in the first place. And re remembering back to that. So, as an example, my wife, Amy, tried to run away from me. Physically. I mean, she physically ran away from me down 2nd Avenue in the rain in Nashville. And I physically said, oh, no, you don't, woman. And I physically chased that woman down 2nd Avenue in the rain in Nashville. And I caught a hold of her. You say, well, did it work? Well, she's my wife, isn't she? I said, you're not getting away from me, woman. Yes. <laughs> May we remember always how we pursue our spouses. Because what is the natural tendency is to become complacent. Well, I got her now. She's my spouse. She's my wife. She signed on the dotted line. I got my hooks at her. And so I'll just get busy with business, with life, and with other things. And so we forget to pursue our spouses, our wives. And wives, this applies to you as well, but I'm speaking to the men here directly right up front. And in the same way, we ought to continue to pursue our first love, Jesus. Now, I don't think that we've necessarily drifted at the way. And one of the things I love about the way that, that Scott instilled in us as, as, as we started out years ago, as he started this church, was that we would preach the full counsel of God's word. We would be faithful to the full counsel of God's word. But that we would continue to remind ourselves of our first love, that there is great value in reminding ourselves of who our first love is, lest we become complacent. We don't ever want to stop chasing after our first love, even if they aren't running from us. We don't ever want to stop. And so that is my prayer. And who knows, we may find that we have become complacent in some areas, or we have come to take things for granted. I don't know, but that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to go through this season and this study in our church, entitled First Love. So, there have been people teaching false things about Jesus since the whole thing started. I mean, from um, literally from the moment the ascension started, people were teaching false things about Jesus. You had people denying every aspect of his existence. They denied his deity. They denied his, his humanity. They divided, uh, denied his work. And we saw some of that in some of the books we preached through. First John. You know, you had John talking about the Antichrist. These people who came into the church and were teaching these false things. What? About Jesus. That's the issue. They were teaching false things about Jesus. The book of Jude was written as a response to people who were coming in and teaching false things about Jesus. They were slandering and perverting the grace of God as it was found in Jesus. And so people have been teaching these false things about Jesus from the very beginning. And one of the reasons we have the New Testament, that they collected it into a, a, a completed canon, a work, was to protect against all of these false teachings that people were, were saying about Jesus, that they were propagating about Jesus. That must mean that it's important to get Jesus right. Because today... You know, what we see is a proliferation of these false teachings. There's nothing new under the sun. You don't even have to write that down. It's in the Bible. There's, there's nothing new. Anything you see taught falsely about Jesus today is merely old heresies, maybe cloaked in new language. And so when you talk to somebody today, they say, yes, I love Jesus. I follow Jesus. I say, well, which Jesus do you follow? Exactly. What do you mean by that when you talk about Jesus? Who exactly is it that you're talking about? There is a particular 
teaching concerning Jesus today. And again, they're, they're every, single, every single false teaching about Jesus that existed in the beginning exists today. Again, it might just be called something else. But there is a particular view of Jesus that I call lesser Jesus. That is propagated in many evangelical circles today. And when I talk about lesser Jesus, I'm talking about kindly Jesus. And you've seen the picture, the paintings of Jesus with the, the, the wind-blown hair. And he's got a, a lamb. And he's surrounded by children. He's friendly Jesus. He would never make any demands of anybody. He would never ask anything of anybody. He's certainly non-threatening. He would never harm anybody. He's, he's toothless. In many ways, he is a neutered Jesus. Vody Bakum calls him a sissified Jesus. He is a needy Jesus. He's a pitiable Jesus. We look to Jesus on the cross when he's hanging there and he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I went KJV there. I'm sorry about that. Why hast thou forsaken me? When we say, poor Jesus, don't we feel sorry for Jesus? Pitiable Jesus hanging there on the cross. Don't we feel sorry for him? Feel sorry for Jesus? As he's quoting Psalm 22, listen to the ends of Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship you, for kingship belongs to you, and he rules over the nations. Feel sorry for Jesus? The lesser Jesus. I seek to, hopefully, Scripture will destroy this view of a lesser Jesus today as we get into the book of Revelation. And I'm calling today's message, Jesus is glorified. And my prayer again is that the word of God would inform our view of Jesus. Our view of Jesus is eminently practical and important and informs every single thing that we do. Every single person has to answer the question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And it drives everything in our lives. So let's get into the book of Revelation chapter 1 and see if the Apostle John will help us figure out exactly who Jesus is. Right up front in, in verse 1, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm really intimidated by the book of Revelation. And uh, you know, maybe one day we'll work up the gumption to preach through the entire book. And if one of y'all have to figure it out, and you come explain it to me, that would be good. Uh, definitely one of the most challenging books. Definitely the most challenging book in all the Bible. Uh, full of imagery, full of uh, you know uh, figurative language and, and, and apocalyptic language and, and visions and 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 I am I urge you to beware. Of anybody who comes and says, well, this is exactly what the book of Revelation means. This means this, and this means this, and this means this, and this represents this. And it's like, well, how do you know that? <laughs> but we can draw some very clear lessons from the book of Revelation right up front in verse 1. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation is revealing who to us who Jesus is. Is And it's given hope to the church late in the first century as they are suffering vast persecutions written by the Apostle John. Now, he doesn't write with it, uh, from an apostolic uh, you know, uh, stance. He doesn't say, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, so you should listen to me. No, he says down in verse 9, he says, I'm your brother and your partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Now, he's on the island of Patmos. Now, that's a, that island exists today. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiny little island. It's about five miles wide, ten miles long, uh, kind of shaped like a crescent. I looked at it on Google Maps. Uh, I'm kind of nerdy. I like to look at stuff on Google Maps. Uh, but it's shaped like a crescent. There's people that live there today. It's a rocky kind of island. And he tells why he was there. Now, he was sent there uh, for on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's in exile on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's in his 90s. Likely. He's an old man either way, and he's on exile in this island called Pet and Patmos. And needless to say, being in exile in a Roman penal colony is probably not a, an enjoyable experience. You know, he doesn't have, you know, like our prison system, three hots and a cot, cable TV, you know, he's got an hour to go to the gym every day. Probably not what he has when he's in exile on the island of Patmos. And it says in verse 10, he says, however, I was in the spirit 
on the Lord's day. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. What a mighty work of God that he's on this barren, rocky island. This little old man, the last of the apostles, left alive and, and with no hope. And it says he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And the Lord reveals this great vision to him, the entire book of Revelation. And he hears behind him a loud voice like a trumpet. He hears this voice and it says, write these things down that I'm about to show you and send it to these seven churches. Send it to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, to Laodicea. And if you plotted those churches, those were seven churches in Asia Minor. They were the postal centers of Asia, Asia Minor. So they were communication centers. There were other churches in Asia Minor. And if you plotted them on a map, they would be, this would be the route that you would travel from Patmos to these churches. This is the route that you would take. And so he's saying, write these things down that I'm about to show you and send it to these seven churches. So you hear a loud voice behind you like a trumpet. What do you do? You turn to see what it is, right? Who it is. And this is what we're going to read starting in verse 12. Where it says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Here is a vision of Jesus. This is John's vision of the glorified Christ. And I want to dig into this and see if we can learn a little bit about Jesus, about how we should view Jesus. Right up front, we're going to wade through each of these aspects for just a minute and spend a, spend a minute on each one of these. The first thing he does when he turns and sees is he sees seven golden lampstands. He sees seven lampstands. Well, what are these lampstands? Well, Jesus actually tells us what these are. These are the church. The lampstands of the church. Well, what is a lampstand? It's, it's a beautiful, ornate thing that shows God's value. He has a high view of the church. And what does a lampstand do? It guards the light. And, displays the light and that's what the church is to do is to guard and display the light that is Christ and so he sees these seven golden lampstands that are the church and then he sees one like the son of man what is the son of man well the son of man is a messianic term and the bottom line is nobody actually knows exactly what the phrase son of man means but Jesus uses this phrase to refer to himself in the third person more than any other way. This is the phrase that he uses to refer to himself. I had a friend that used to refer to himself in the third person all the time. He, he could pull it off. I tried it. It didn't work for me. Jesus can pull it off. He's Jesus. He is the son of man. And this is the phrase. It's a messianic phrase that he uses to refer to himself. And what does he see but Jesus standing in the midst of these seven golden lampstands? Jesus is in the midst of the church. He is empowering the church. Galatians 2.20, Paul tells us, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We don't worship a dead deity. We don't worship a statue. We don't worship a book. We worship a living God who is among the church, dwelling within the church, empowering the church to accomplish his will and his purposes. This is the church that we are a part of. This is the God that we serve, Jesus, and he's in the midst of the church, and he's one like a son of man. This is Jesus as John sees him in Revelation chapter 1. The first thing he notices are how he's dressed. He notices, notices his clothing. He's in a, in a long robe. This is a, a kingly robe. Jesus is the king. He is currently sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and his kingdom has been inaugurated. He has assumed the throne, and God is about the business of putting all of his enemies under his feet as a footstool. All things are in subjection to him. All things, not some things, not many things, but all things are in subjection to him. He is the king, and he is wearing his kingly robes. He's got a golden sash 
across his chest. What is this golden sash? Well, this reminds us that Jesus is not only the king, he is our priest as well. We go turn to the book of Hebrews to remind us about this in chapter 2, verse 17. Author of Hebrews says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Chapter 3, verse 1, Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Chapter 4, verse 14, tells us, Since, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And so when we see this golden sash across his chest, this is a reminder that he is our priest and he is currently sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for us Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and what a great thought that is so he turns and he sees he hears his voice and he sees the first thing these these clothes this this, this kingly robe and this priestly sash and then he notices his hair his hair is white now it's not just white it's blazing white. It's brilliant white. It's glowing white is the Greek language. It's not just, you know, white like these walls. It's like white as if it's glowing. And it reminds us of Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. His vision of the ancient of days when he sees God. He has this vision of God. It's very similar to this. And it reminds us of his purity. And not only his purity, but his demand for purity from us. In 1 Peter, he says, be holy because I am holy. And Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us that he will pursue holiness in his church. He will discipline his people. He will chastise his people to compel them to walk into holiness. John chapter 15 tells us that he will prune the tree. He will prune the tree. And his hair reminds us of his holiness. And then his eyes. He sees his eyes. He's staring. His eyes are penetrating to him. They're burning. They're blazing as if they are on fire. It reminds me of the language in Revelation 2 verse 18. He sees Jesus again who has eyes like a flame of fire. Whose feet are like burnished bronze. This gives me another vision of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. He's talking about the word of God that is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword. And he he says, no creature, no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account, whom we must give an account. This is the eyes of Jesus, and he sees them in their flaming. And then we see his feet are like burnished bronze. You know, they're, they're, like, they're like bronze that has been pulled out of the kiln, and they're, they're still glowing. They're, they're so hot. This is, these are the feet of his judgment. And it tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, that it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And he sees this represented in his feet, and then he hears his voice. He hears this voice. It was like a trumpet. It's like raging waters. Raging waters. John chapter 5 tells us that his voice will one day cause people to come out of the grave. The sheer voice of Jesus. This is the power of the voice of Jesus. The words of Jesus will cause even the dead to rise up out of the grave. And then there's this sword coming from his mouth. And the sword is the word of God that is living and active. And it is sharp and it penetrates to the division of soul and spirit and bone and marrow. And then we see his face and the glory of his face. And it shines forth from him much like it did at the transfiguration. Or when Moses had this, this view and he came down and he's reflecting the glory of God. And we see this magnificent image of Jesus. We see this image of Jesus and what is his response? Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. How do we respond to Jesus? It reminds me of Isaiah in chapter 6 as he's confronted with the heavenly, you know, this vision of God in, in, the, in the heavenly throne room. And it says that, that he, he hungers down and he says to himself, woe is me. Woe is me. We trivialize the word woe. We say, well, woe is me. I'm having a hard day. A hard day. A, tr a tree fell on my truck. You know, woe is me. No, that's not what the word woe means. Woe is a word of judgment. And so in that phrase, Isaiah is calling down judgment upon himself. 
He's confronted with a view of God. He sees God as he is. And his only response is, woe is me to call down judgment upon himself. I am lost, he says. And I think if we could read the thoughts of John as he's laying down prone in front of the glorified Christ. And he's laying there as dead. We would see in his mind similar words to Isaiah. Woe is me, for I am lost. This is the response that John has to Jesus, to the glorified Christ, to this amazing image of Jesus. What is our response to Christ? What is our response to Jesus? How casual do people in the church today view Jesus? He's our homeboy. He's my buddy. He's my chum. Jesus. This is how many people in the church view Jesus today. Well, how do they do that? Well, if you look at the, the attributes listed here of Jesus, one at a time, we rob Jesus of his authority. We don't like authority. We want to be the captains of our own destiny. We don't want to relinquish authority of our lives. To, now, we will relinquish the easy things, right? But there are certain things that we like to have authority over. And so we declare that we have authority instead of Jesus. We rob him of his kingship. We rob him of his priesthood. He does most of the work, but I will join with him in my salvation. He will throw me a life preserver, but I'll be the one who grabs on it. He does most of the work, but I, I cooperate with him in accomplishing the work of salvation. He stands gently at the door of my heart knocking because he's a kindly Jesus. He's a gentleman Jesus. I have to get up and open the door to my heart to let him in. I have to invite Jesus in. And so we rob Jesus of his priesthood. We ignore or trivialize the purity as displayed by his white hair and we slander his grace is a way that we rob him of this. We say, you know, yeah, I, I will I will quit the sins, the big sins, but I, I got a couple or maybe one that I really like to do. And I know that he will forgive me because he's a kind of Jesus. He's a friendly Jesus. He's a forgiving Jesus. He would never judge anybody. We disregard his judgment. We close the word of God, put it on the shelf so we don't hear his voice. And ultimately we bring Jesus down and put him to work for us. What are the implications of denying different aspects of Jesus? There are the implications. These are very important. Why would we put our trust and confidence in a lesser Jesus? I mean, I'll trust him with the easy things, right? What are the hard things for you to trust God with? I don't know about you, but there are things in my life, a, a, a handful of things that, that I really like to maintain control of. And are very hard for me to trust God with. I mean, there's some things that are easy. So what is it for you? Money. A lot of people are really like to keep control of their finances, their money. And so relinquishing control of that to Jesus is an issue. Why would we do that to a lesser Jesus? Why would we ever yield to a lesser Jesus? Over and over, we are called to do one thing to God, to Jesus, to yield to relinquish. Why would we do that to a lesser Jesus? Why would we not tolerate impurity and sin in ourselves and in those around us? Why would we not allow our brothers and sisters in Christ to languish under the yoke of sin if we worship a lesser Jesus? We would, because it wouldn't matter as much. And the ultimate end state are less effective Christians, spiritually shallow Christians, Fearful, timid, and content or comfortable Christians. Why on earth would I go and make myself uncomfortable and not step out in fear if I'm worshiping a lesser Jesus? Why would I do that? I wouldn't. I would be content and comfortable where I'm at. And the ultimate conclusion of the propagation of this teaching of a lesser Jesus is that our churches are filled with unsaved people who worship this lesser Jesus, who worship this foe Jesus, and are not saved. That is the ultimate end state, the ultimate destination of worshiping a lesser Jesus. And so what you have in the Western church is the Walmart effect. You have churches shutting down local conferences 
congregations whereby people actually have intimacy and fellowship and accountability with one another. And we collect them into larger and larger groups with better and better programs to entertain the goats. And the issue is, is that it doesn't work. Every single generation, every single generation is less and less church. Millennials, Generation Z, every single generation is less and less church in America. Our church model is failing drastically, and it's an issue of our view of Jesus. Well, here is the real issue. The real issue is that one day he, he is going to set everyone straight on their view of Jesus. One day, every single person who is living, has lived, or will live, will have an appropriate view of Jesus as he returns in power and glory. We'll see heaven open. We'll behold a white horse and one sitting on it called faithful and true and in righteousness. What will Jesus do? He will judge and make war. This is what Jesus is going to do. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His head are like many diadems. He has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations. That sounds familiar to me. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the Jesus of the Bible. And one day there will be no mistaking in every single person's heart and mind who Jesus is. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if we stopped right there, if we stopped right there, it would be perfectly just. If we stopped right there and left with you and I face down before Jesus as though dead, if we just stopped right there, we would be perfectly just and perfectly right. And we said Jesus and we just went to Cracker Barrel. We left early. We could do that. Because the bottom line is that Jesus would be perfectly righteous and perfectly just. He would still be God if he condemned us all to hell. That is the bottom line. He would still be God. Perfect, just, and righteous in that. And we ask the question, why doesn't Jesus save everybody? The real question, the right question is, why does, it, why does Jesus save anybody? That's the right question. And so how do we respond to Jesus? I said last week... Your boys aren't here. I'm going to use their favorite word again. What's my favorite word in all the Bible? But. But. There's always more with Jesus. There's always more with Jesus. Right? And so, as we get a vision and a picture of who Jesus actually is, and we reject the fuzzy, lesser Jesus of contemporary Christianity, and this drives us to our face as if we are dead, and we have a heart like the, the tax collector, collector from Luke 17, who can only beat on his chest and say, save me, a sinner. Save me, a sinner. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. I am lost. But, verse 17, he laid his right hand on me and said, fear not. Fear not. That phrase means absolutely nothing if it's a lesser Jesus, if it's a diminished Jesus, if it's a Jesus that we have already brought down to our level. It means nothing that he would condescend to us. It means nothing that he would come to us and put his hand upon us and say, fear not. But when I see Jesus in all of his glory, when I see him glorified, when I see him high and lifted up, when I see him as King Jesus, as our prophet, as our priest, as our king, as when I see him as a Jesus who is holy and demands holiness, when I see him as a Jesus who will one day tread the winepress of the fury of God, the idea that he would come and put his hands on my shoulder and say, fear not. That makes that condescension meaningful. 
that means something. That he would do that. That he would not only do that, that he would adopt us. That he would love us. That he would put his hands upon our shoulders and say, fear not. That he would give us the spirit of God that which we might cry, Abba, Father. And so my prayer this morning is that we would reject, that we would reject foe Jesus. We would reject lesser Jesus. That we would truly embrace Jesus for who he really is. As we see in Revelation chapter 1. But at the same time that we would trust and feel his right hand upon our shoulders saying fear not. So I'm going to pray. And I pray that as we're praying you pray with me. And that we would as a congregation reject faux views of Jesus. We would reject a lesser Jesus. And we would embrace the Jesus in his totality as displayed to us in Revelation chapter 1. Would you pray with me? Lord we love you. We praise you. God, you are high and lifted up. God, I pray that you are magnified in the name of Jesus. God, right here this morning, we reject as a congregation, lesser Jesus. We reject foe Jesus. We reject all of these false views of Jesus. And we embrace Jesus as you are, God. And we fall to our face before you as dead. We beat our chest and say, save us. Save me. I'm a sinner. We're like Isaiah, woe is me, I am lost, I'm a man of unclean lips, but God, we know, we believe your word, we believe your promises, we believe your truth, that you come and you put your hands upon our shoulders and say, fear not, fear not. God, I can't even understand or fathom the depths of your condescension. I can't, it's, it's, it's indescribable to me. God, when I consider who I am and who you are, I can't understand it. I can't explain it. I've heard it called scandalous. God, that you would save me. That you would pour out your mercy and your grace upon me. I just can't understand it at all. And so, God, we embrace Jesus. We embrace the biblical view of the fullness of the character of Jesus. We embrace the glorified Christ of Revelation 1. We embrace the humble Christ as he goes to the cross. Spills his blood for me and for you. And so God, I pray for this congregation. I pray that we would always pursue you in your fullness. In your kingship, your priesthood, your purity, your righteousness, your justice, your wrath, your love. The fullness of you will never understand it this side of glory. But may that be our pursuit. God, as we launch this body of believers into this new season, this new year, I pray that we would be centered upon this view of Jesus. God, that we would see you rightly. God, lift the veil, the cloud of our mind that, that distracts us, that, 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 that hinders our view of you. God, we do, we love you, and we praise you. We ask these things in your name.